Starting next week, we will enter a two-month sermon series on the life of the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. We're simply calling it Life Lessons from Jeremiah. So I hope that you'll begin uh, reintroducing yourselves to the prophet Jeremiah. It's a wonderful story. He was a wonderful witness for God. And I encourage you to begin reminding yourself of the prophet Jeremiah. Today, we finish our sermon series that we've been doing for the months of July and August on the Lord's Prayer. I, I know I have been enriched by my personal study of the Lord's Prayer that I've been doing for the months of July and August. I, I trust that our study together has been mutually beneficial. We have looked at the Lord's Prayer. We've seen the Lord's Prayer as a model prayer for all of our praying. That's really the way it's presented to us in Matthew's Gospel. We've looked at the Lord's Prayer as a prayer to be prayed. That's the way it's presented to us in Luke's Gospel. Uh, we have noticed that the Lord's Prayer teaches us to whom we pray, our Father in heaven. Uh, the Lord's Prayer reminds us with whom we pray. Uh, hopefully you've noticed all of the, the plural pronouns in the Lord's Prayer. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're praying it together with our sisters and brothers in Christ. And we spent time going through each of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. We noticed that the prayer taught us to, to start with the most important petitions. Start with those ultimate concerns of God. Start with God's prayer list. Uh, the first three petitions are God's ultimate concerns. That God's name will be held holy here in this world. That God's kingdom will come. And that God's will will be done right here on this earth, right now, as is being done right now in heaven. And then we saw that the Lord's Prayer encouraged us, gave us permission to turn toward ourselves at this point and to pray for that which is necessary for our physical lives. And we saw that petition that encourages us to pray for that which is necessary for our physical life, give us this day our daily bread. And then we also saw that the Lord's Prayer encourages us to pray for that which is necessary, essential for the spiritual life. The receiving of forgiveness from God and the ability to share that forgiveness with, other, with others. And then we've seen in the Lord's Prayer how we are reminded by the Lord's Prayer that this world is a very dangerous world. So we pray, lead us not to temptation, but we're quick to note that when we do find ourselves in those times of temptation and trial and testing, that we're quick to pray, but deliver us from evil. This morning, we get to the end of the Lord's Prayer. We get to that final doxology that closes out the Lord's Prayer for us. A doxology is just simply a song or an inscription of praise to God because of God's glory. Doxa is a Greek word for glory. So we end the Lord's Prayer with that great doxology for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And it's really important that we know why we end our prayer with this doxology. We're actually called, by the way, to be a people of doxology. The Bible is filled with doxologies ascriptions of praise, songs of praise, verses of praise to God for His glory. The Bible is filled with these doxologies. We use doxologies in worship. This prayer, the Lord's Prayer, ends with a doxology. We're called to be a people of doxology. And that means, by the way, I think, that we should not necessarily just whine our way through life, but doxologize our way through life. I think I just made up a word, but we should doxology our way through life rather than just whine our way through life. We are to be a people of doxology. And we all know this great doxology that ends the Lord's Prayer. Now before we study the Lord's Prayer together, I invite you to join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven,
Amen. Most of you know, many of you know, that I was not raised a United Methodist. I consciously, intentionally chose the United Methodist Church when I was in seminary. As I studied and prayed and sought where it was that God would have me serve in the Christian community for the, for the term of my ministry while here on this earth, and after much prayer and study, I consciously, intentionally chose the United Methodist family, the United Methodist tradition of the Christian community. And there's a great, great deal, obviously, that I appreciate about the United Methodist family. Uh, I appreciate that we have always been very mission-driven. From our earliest days, we've been mission-driven. We want to take this world and offer this world at the throne of Jesus Christ. And we will do just about, just about whatever is necessary to accomplish that mission to make sure that we do what we're called to do. And that's one of the reasons, as United Methodists, we have the freedom to be creative, the freedom to be innovative, as we seek to serve this present age. Not serve a past age, but we're called to serve this present age, and we can be innovative and creative as we serve this present age, as we seek to take this world and take this world to Jesus. So I'm very grateful that as United Methodists, we've always had this strong sense of just getting the job done, doing whatever it takes to be in ministry to this world in which we find ourselves. But also as United Methodist, I've always been very, very grateful that while we can be creative and innovative throughout our church life together, we also have a deep and abiding respect for the best of Christian tradition. We have a deep and abiding respect, particularly for the best of Christian tradition concerning worship. Let me just offer you a little commercial at this point. You see a note in your bulletin that uh, during the fall, beginning on, I believe, September the 8th, maybe, sometime in the fall, uh, I'm going to begin a study over in the chapel on Wednesday evenings from 6.40 to 7.30. I'm entitling the study, Worship by the Book. And we're going to be looking at what the Scriptures and what Christian tradition teaches us about worship. Now, I've noticed over the last three decades of serving the Christian community that we all tend to have strong opinions about worship. We all tend to be very opinionated about worship, the way it should happen when we gather as a Christian community. But I've also noticed over the years that if I push you on those opinions, and I say, why? You know, I hear profound things like, well, this is just the way we've always done it. Or I hear profound things like, well, that's the way my mom and my grandmama did it. Or then my favorite is, this just feels right to me. Um, there are really some better criteria with which we can judge and thus create Christian worship for the community. And I think it's important for us to go to the Scriptures, go to the best in Christian tradition, and, and look at how worship should happen if we're trying to do the hard work of offering ourselves to God in worship. Perhaps you recall in the Bible, particularly the Hebrew Testament, all of the verses that are given at great length as to how you approach God. Those are verses about how to worship. What is worship? What is good worship? Is there such a thing as bad worship? I think there are certainly such a thing as bad church services. It's important for us to know what worship is and to pay attention to what it is that we use as criteria for evaluating worship. In the United Methodist tradition, we can be innovative, we can be creative, but we also have a great, great and abiding respect for the best in the Christian worship tradition. Let me give an example. Because we stand in that historic stream of the Christian community, we have services in our book of worship for weddings and for funerals and for Sunday morning worship and for the celebration of Holy Communion and for the celebration of baptism. It's not just up to us to, in, to reinvent that every time we come together. We know that we're in a, a stream that's 2,000 years old and we can access that stream and pull out of that stream the best in worship. And as a result of that, we have worship that I think, uh, in our better moments, is very biblical and very theologically grounded. For instance, we have a service for for burial. We have a service for committal following the burial in a cemetery. 
And I've always been so grateful, and I hope you've noticed this if you've attended United Methodist burial services. I've always been so grateful that at the end of the committal service, the very last thing that we say, for being true to our tradition, the very last thing that we say is we use a benediction, a doxology, if you will, a doxology from the New Testament book of Jude, the two concluding verses in the New Testament book of Jude, the doxology that says, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. And it's important to me that those are the final words that are left echoing in people's ears and hearts as they walk away from the graveside. I prefer that over, thank y'all for being here. Y'all come back now, you're here. We've got cookies and punch in the fellowship hall now. It's important for me to make sure that the last thing that we hear as we walk away from that graveside is, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that in our tradition we can be creative and innovative, but we have a deep and abiding respect for the best that is in Christian tradition. I remember several years ago, I was with a group of clergy, and we had just received some news of a horrendous tragedy. And we circled and we prayed, and I remember we asked Jack Yarborough to pray. Some of you may know Jack. He, he's a retired member of our annual conference of preachers. He's been in retired status serving Centenary United Methodist Church in Winston-Salem for quite a while. We, we called on Jack to lead us in prayer, and I'll never forget the prayer that Jack prayed in the midst of just receiving the news of a great tragedy. We joined hands. There was a short period of silence, and then Jack simply prayed, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That prayer of doxology. I want us to look at this doxological ending to the Lord's Prayer for just a few moments. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you look in your Bibles, you, you know, by the way, if you've taken disciple Bible study, you know this too. You know that that doxological phrase, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, is not in the biblical text. It's not in the oldest manuscripts we have of Matthew. That's why if you look at your Bibles, if you go look in Matthew, either it will be there with a footnote saying this is not in the oldest, best manuscripts, or it won't be there at all, and there'll be a footnote that says in some later manuscripts we have this, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we know that it's not there in the oldest manuscripts, which if you've ever gone to a Mass in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, you noticed that they finished praying the Lord's Prayer with deliver us from evil, period. Because they actually paid attention to the Bible and they noticed it's not there. It's, it's there in some later manuscripts of Matthew. And as a matter of fact, it's actually in an early Christian document called the Didache. That's just Greek for the teaching. It's in one of the earliest Christian documents called the Didache from about the year 95. So uh, that's pretty close to the time of the writing of the Gospels. That that doxological phrase is there concluding the Lord's Prayer. And I agree with J.I. Packer, a, a great theologian of, of our century, who said one time, well, it may not be in the best manuscripts, but it's in the best tradition of the Christian community to conclude the Lord's Prayer with that doxological benediction at the end. And I really am so glad that we do, because if we didn't conclude it with that, and I can see why the early Christian community, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, created and brought this doxological phrase, which, by the way, comes from 1 Chronicles, probably, in the Hebrew Bible. The reason they started using this dox doxological phrase at the end of uh, the Lord's Prayer is if we don't, then this marvelous prayer that begins with the Father ends with the evil one, the devil. So I'm glad that we decided at some point to not end the prayer right there, but to make sure we end the prayer with a shout of praise and giving glory to God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
And every time we pray that, I hope you understand what you're praying. It's a scary prayer, like much of the Lord's Prayer. I hope you understand what you're praying. Because any time we pray for thine, for your, yours, you God, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, is, 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 a, is a threatening, challenging prayer. And it, it certainly has political and personal ramifications. Because we, particularly in the political world, as we gather ourselves together as nations, which is what we've done now for about 5,000 years, as we gather ourselves together for nations, we as a people, and regardless of which people you may be, throughout the history of the human race, you have desired to have the kingdom. We have desired to have the power, and we have desired to have the glory. And human history is writ large throughout the total history of the human race with, with peoples and governments and nations, be they democracies or dictatorships, both trying to get the kingdom, the power, and the glory through bloodshed if necessary. But when we pray this prayer, we're saying, that's not what we want. We want God to have the kingdom and the power and the glory. And there's certainly personal ramifications when we pray this, because we are so busy, so active each and every day of our life, creating, trying to create our own little kingdoms, our own little realms of influence, but when we pray this prayer, we're saying, come and take down my kingdom, God, for the sake of your kingdom. And we also know that as human beings, we love to get the power. And we also know that we don't know quite what to do with it when we get it. We know that power corrupts. Lord Acton told us power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But we love to get the power. But this prayer says we, we don't want the power. We want God to have the power. And the glory, and we know how much we love glory. I mean, think about what we do to our sports stars and our entertainment stars. We love to have the glory, and some people live their whole life trying to get that glory. But when we pray this concluding doxology to the Lord's Prayer, we're saying we want the kingdom and the power and the glory to belong to God. And then we have the audacity of saying the word amen at the end of that. Amen doesn't mean the end. Amen means so be it. Amen means right on. Amen means this is the truth. And when we say amen to something, we're saying this is the truth, and that other stuff is not the truth. This is the truth. My friends, as we bring our sermon series to a close, as we have worked our way through the Lord's Prayer, I know now I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that, that I want this prayer to be my model for praying. I want this prayer to be my model for living. That's why I, I want to say amen to the end of this prayer. And I hope that all of you, I hope that all of you truly desire for this prayer to be your model for praying. I hope that all of you earnestly desire for this prayer to be your model for living? And if so, would you say, this is the truth. This is the truth to which we have committed. And this is the truth that we have committed to take to the world around us. So together as a people, together as a people more than anything else in life, we want this prayer to model our praying, and we want this prayer to model our living. And that's why with great joy and with great power, we can say, That's not strong enough. Amen.